Welcome to SBTI's training for financial institutions. This is module number seven, scope three finance submissions with the specific data considerations. For this module, you should have reviewed modules one through six and have an understanding of scope three finance submissions. And we'll be talking specifically around data considerations and trade-offs that financial institutions will have to make. After completing this module, you will be able to explain data quality levels and interpret their relative accuracy, engage stakeholders to set targets despite limited data, and create an action plan to improve data quality for your organization and for your clients or portfolio companies. Let's get started. As discussed in module three, emissions are classified into direct, scope one, and indirect emissions, scope two and three. Scope three can be divided into those originating from companies' operations, categories one through 14, and those originating from finance emissions, category 15. In modules four through seven, we will explore how to set targets for each of these categories of emissions. Because scope three finance emissions are so much larger for financial institutions, we will spend more time on how to calculate scope three finance emissions. This module focuses on the key data considerations that financial institutions will face. Let's begin by naming the fact that financial institutions face many data issues while setting science-based targets. To name a few, there are issues with having access to many data sources, which are often external and dealing with missing or low quality data. Additionally, there's often inconsistent or unclear definitions of what data are describing or what data is required. Financial institutions are also facing technology and data system challenges, both in their own rooms and with their portfolio companies and clients. Furthermore, evolving guidance and non-standardized disclosure requirements for mission data are abundant. And there's a industry and global wide reliance on estimates and industry level intensity data versus actuals. This naturally leads to associated short and long-term challenges, such as financial institutions who have paralysis on setting targets or ambiguous and changing metrics as they grow their maturity. They might have limited tracking or understanding of what they are tracking. And of course, this leads to unmanaged risk and lack of value creation for climate transformation efforts. And even when financial institutions and their portfolio companies or clients are making progress, there can be challenges in showing that progress given that there's a reliance on these estimation methods. With all that said, financial institutions can still take action despite the existing data challenges. To begin, let's understand PCAF, the Partnership of Carbon Accounting Financials, and their data quality framework. The data quality framework uses the numbers one through five, with one being the highest and five being the worst. Moving to the second column, there are three types of calculated methods, reported emissions, physical activity, or intensity emissions, and economic or intensity emissions. Moving to the descriptions, I'll highlight a few points. The highest quality data with a score of one requires verification of known emissions. Data quality score two includes both known but not audited emissions and estimates based on energy consumption, since those are reliable estimates. Data quality three is similarly based in physical intensity but based on production rather than energy that was consumed. And moving to scores four and five, which are based on economic intensity, these three methods are based on revenues, assets, and then revenue and asset turnover if specific revenues and assets can't be tied to specific projects. Now, it's important to note that while ambition should be to reach a high data quality score for your portfolio, the reality is that from 2020 to 2021, according to Bain's um, June 2022 study of banks' great carbon challenges, global financial institutions with investments in the energy and power sectors had scores ranging from 3.3 to 4.3. Again, that's mostly based on production and revenue level estimates. Another common concern that financial institutions have around data quality are about the errors that may be at risk. So let's discuss that in detail. Let's talk about data quality through examining two different portfolio companies and what happens as they grow their data maturity. Our first example is a power generation company. 
and they estimate their emissions to be about 10 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted using, again, revenue-based data, data quality four or five. Over time, they were able to track down their actual emissions and realize they had a data and achieved a data quality score of two. They discovered that their plants were much more efficient than industry standards and estimates. In fact, their emissions were only 10% of the original estimates. For a second example, an industrial company, they estimated that they had 8 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emitted, again, while they were using PCAF quality score four or five revenue level data. When they were able to track actual emissions or estimates based on energy consumed, PCAF quality two, the resulting factor was double the estimate, 16 tons of equivalent carbon dioxide. Now, again, these examples came from the Bain and Company study naming that carbon challenges that banks in particular face. But this is true for many financial institutions, which is that given the current nature of data quality, initial targets of portfolio companies and clients will have large errors in both directions. That said, financial institutions taking actions, it's even more important for financial institutions to take actions despite this ambiguity due to the role that they can play influencing action in the real economy and influencing and increasing the data quality and tracking of their portfolio companies and clients. Now, across financial institutions and the real economy, companies are setting targets despite data nascency. And there is several examples across scope one and two, scope three operational, and scope three finance, where everyone is able to set these targets despite the nascency. And so we've talked a few of these examples and you can learn more about these specific examples in modules four, five, and six. Now, even with these current data challenges, there are a few items that we want to emphasize in how financial institutions should and can do to catalyze change. The first is to start somewhere. Financial institutions can focus on areas where more precise industry estimates exist. Since financial institutions are required to set headline targets, you can see that your peers across the industry may only be covering 10, 15, or 20% of their portfolios with their current targets, but investment has been made in taking action on climate mitigation. Financial institutions can foster engagement. They should catalyze change at their portfolio companies or with customers, especially for those financial institutions who are using the temperature reading approach. They can focus and use their influence on companies who are the heaviest emitters within their portfolios. By doing this, financial institutions will build momentum. As you make investments in data, others are likely to follow, and financial institutions can embed data quality requirements into future processes such as underwriting at banks and follow up with investees or clients on their progress to make sure that they're setting their own targets or tracking their own data. And this urgency is noted across several other actors in the ecosystems, such as GFANS, who says that, you know, data availability and methodologies are rapidly evolving, and the direction of travel is as important as accuracy. PCAF agrees, and they say that measuring finance emissions is crucial to growing understanding, which triggers internal discussions and stakeholder engagement to identify concrete actions. Both organizations complement SBTI's influence principle, which again anchors on the fact that financial institutions should leverage the influence they have over companies, policymakers, and other financial institutions. And this ensures that the rules are supportive of financial institutions' own climate actions. To sum it up, substantial progress can be made even in sectors currently without guidance. And it's important for us all to remember that we will only meet 1.5 degrees through our collective ambition. Now, what does this look like? Tactically, to take action we believe that financial institutions can hone in on processes, tools, and data in order to address some of the current challenges. And this, again, is for both financial institutions as well as their portfolio companies and clients. And this end state is going to look like processes that are centered around decarbonization. For example, renewing intake processes for clients or embedding emissions into KPIs for their portfolio companies for investors. And these processes should be embedded throughout the business and ideally automated, especially in the end state. Now, we recognize that in order to implement these processes, companies need the right tools. 
This sector is actively growing, and in the end state, we envision a robust and actively utilized set of tools around decarbonization and tracking emissions data. Lastly, we envision the future state for companies and financial institutions is that data is a core input to decision making, since it will be much higher quality and backed with a data strategy that has high quality emissions data at its center. Now, SBTI doesn't expect that financial institutions will be able to do this alone. Companies and financial institutions alike will require the support of partners along the way, with a few key capabilities such as ratings agencies, data aggregators, and carbon footprint providers, just to name a few. These will be trusted and valued partners that help you and your portfolio companies and clients achieve your climate transformation. And lastly, it's important for financial institutions to engage stakeholders and act to increase data quality. And what that means is that looking at clients and portfolio companies, financial institutions can ask them to grow their data quality and sophistication through the touch points that financial institutions already have, and also increase the number of commitments and science-based targets within their portfolios. Across industry peers, financial institutions can look to collaborate or partner using open source tools or opening or sharing methodologies with peers as it makes sense, seeking common approaches and tools as well. And lastly, on the government and public sector, financial institutions can engage with these policymakers to engage and set standard data and financial institution required reporting, such already exists in the financial world, and to dialogue on carbon policy to ensure that there's a clear direction of travel in a given region or country. To close out, there are a few key takeaways from this module. The first is that high quality emissions data is both rare and important. And it's a shared challenge for nearly all financial institutions. Data quality is important, and there are quantifiable ramifications on decarbonization targets in both positive and negative directions. But even more importantly, financial institutions need to invest in processes and tools, and that will improve the data quality for both their firms and that of their portfolios and clients. And despite data challenges, financial institutions can improve data quality over time through engagement with a broader ecosystem. Thank you for listening today.